Vegetation assessment forms an important part of this course. Over the course of the semester, we'll make use of vegetation data that we have collected from Gallimbury Black Mountain to illustrate key points associated with quantitative analysis of data. Skills that are important for not just for environmental science students, but for science students in general. Now, even though we assess vegetation throughout the semester, that assessment process is not necessarily central to the content that we're focused on. Nevertheless, it's important that you understand vegetation assessment. One, because if you're an environmental science student, it's an important thing for you to understand. But two, because of course, interpretation of your data relies upon, in part, as we've already seen, content level knowledge. It's important that you develop some content level knowledge or at least you go out to the field with some content level knowledge so that you can interpret what you see around you or you can interpret your own data. Now there are many reasons why we describe vegetation and I'm not really going to stand here and read through all of these key points. But if we want to understand vegetation we want to be able to describe its diversity, its patterning, understand the relationship between environmental variables, be they biophysical or, bi or biotic interactions between different species, plants and animals. If we want to be able to identify the impacts of disturbance and management, we need data that are going to allow that kind of description and analysis. To do that, of course, we need to get out there and we need to measure vegetation so that we can actually describe it. The question arises though, of course, the moment we start thinking about describing vegetation, what is it that we're interested in describing? Well, in general, we're interested in two things, structure and composition. And that's what we're going to do on Black Mountain. Remember, the content that I delivered in week one that focused on the composition of Black Mountain in terms of the overstory species and discussed briefly the understory species and the connection between stand structure and disturbance. Indeed, there are places on Black Mountain we can go to in which the overstory was cleared for, um, or at least felled, for firewood plantations, areas where we believe that the overstory has remained undisturbed since the traditional owners made use of the area. Now, when it comes to understanding vegetation, one of the important elements surrounding vegetation that has become particularly important in recent years is the use of structural indicators. Now, if we are interested in assessing vegetation, the question becomes, how do we efficiently assess vegetation for, to assess management outcomes and to describe key attributes such as biodiversity? Well, in recent years, well, I guess 2000 isn't that recent for each of you. It doesn't feel that long ago for me. In recent decades then, the use of structural indicators has proven to be an effective way for describing and modeling ecosystems not just because of the structure associated, but because of, the, because of biodiversity associated with that structure. Think about coral reefs. How much does the composition in terms of the species mix of corals matter to the fish that make use of that structural space? Is it the structure or the species that matters? Well, progressively in ecosystem-based studies, the structure rather than the pure composition of ecosystems has become important. Now structure itself is not only an indicator of other processes, but it is a process in and of itself. Let's have a look at the way that we describe structure because there are many attributes that we might wish to describe in a forest ecosystem. If we were, for instance, interested in fauna, Avifauna, birds, arboreal fauna, perhaps we're interested in the herpetofauna. We can measure vegetation attributes 
and then identify associations between those vegetation attributes and fauna abundance and composition. We can do that and you can see there's quite a lot, well at least during in this publication in 2006, there was quite a lot of existing literature in Australian forests and woodlands that described associations between structural attributes and fauna abundance or composition. So it's useful from that point of view. And you can see that, or rather those associations, in a different way. You can see the types of structural attributes when we go out and describe vegetation and their association with different fauna components. For example, if we look at structural indicators associated with the size of individual trees, for example, see here, we can see that perhaps the number or basal area of large trees or the basal area of overstory stems or down the bottom here the basal area of acacia species can be used as a structural indicator for fauna composition and abundance. When we say basal area, what do we actually mean then? Because bear in mind, this is also an important trait used by Pook and Moore. So Pook and Moore, in their paper, describe two key attributes associated with forest structure. One, basal area, and two, stocking. First, let's just understand what basal area is. Well, basal area is a ratio-based estimator of the density of a stand. It integrates both the number of trees, but also their size. That is, we measure all of the trees present within a plot area, and we use those sizes to generate a total area occupied by trees. And that, of course, is a product of how many there are and how big they are. Of course, basal area is calculated using a sectional area function, sectional area of a circle. Again that key assumption that our measurements describe a circle. That is, we wrap a diameter tape around a tree, divide it by two to give us the radius, square that and multiply by pi to, pi to give us the basal area of a stem. Now that basal area can be summed across a plot so here, the sum of basal areas for an individual trees on a plot divided by the area of the plot itself in metres squared and multiplied by 10,000 to give us a fairly standard metric of forest structure, and that is the basal area per hectare. Now, you can see that down here on the right-hand side, this is a graph from Pook and Moore in which they describe basal area in square feet represented against diameter at breast height. So they break down their diameter breast height classes and then represent how much basal area at the stand level those components represent. An interesting way of looking at basal area and the relative contribution of individual species at the stand level. But bear in mind that this y-axis includes both size and the numerical abundance of individual diameter classes. It's an unusual thing for us to do now. We'll be looking at, at distributions of basal area data a little bit later on this semester. The other metric that Pook and Moore use is this metric of stocking. And stocking is really just a count of the number of stems per hectare. Of course, we don't, nece we, we don't necessarily measure a hectare. We might measure a smaller plot, perhaps in our case, we measure a 20 by 20 metre plot. So that's 400 metres squared as opposed to the 10,000 metres squared that make up a hectare. Doesn't matter, we can scale it up. Now stems again are represented on a per hectare basis. Stems per hectare. And that's simply calculated as the number of stems, N subscript F, S, so the number of stems that we find on a plot divided by the area of the plot Again, multiplied by 10,000. Again, we have a representation of the number of stems present per acre here. Remember that 
Bougainmore's paper was published at a time when imperial measurements were still used rather than the metric systems we use now, you can see that diameter represented against, or rather stocking represented against diameter breast height. Again, an interesting way of looking at how, how much, in terms of stems per hectare, individual diameter classes constitutes. The distinction then between sectional area and stems per hectare is that the latter, stems per hectare, excludes size. Remember, basal area is an integration of both size and abundance. Both metrics are useful in understanding disturbance and competition at the stand level, and both of them are useful when it comes to understanding the relationship or the impact upon fauna species. Well, that's a very specific example of structure at a stand level. What about at a larger scale? What about at the national scale? What do we assess when it comes to vegetation and vegetation structure? Well, across the country, we use something that is referred to as the National Vegetation Information System. The National Vegetation Information System is a scalable system that allows for a, a hierarchy of descriptors to be used to describe at different spatial scales. It has important components, it's widely used across the country, and so there's national consistency in the way that vegetation is mapped and surveyed, and it allows for a very detailed and comprehensive description that scales dependent upon the size of the area that we're surveying. The system itself is based upon historic vegetation classification, in particular a very notable classification conducted by Specht in 1974. An important aspect that I've already mentioned is this information hierarchy, that depending upon the spatial scale at which researchers, government bodies, even private landholders are working at, you can scale the amount of information that you collect from a local area. And you can see that here. You can see that at the highest level, at the class level, the hierarchy level one, only the dominant growth form of the dominant stratum is described. And then progressively, as you move down through the levels, there's progressively more and more information added. Of course, the trade-off here is that while you get more information, it takes longer for you to collect that information or to collect those data. A typical level that we tend to work at when we're describing vegetation is at the broad floristic formation level. The broad floristic formation level has several components. You can see that first it has dominant growth form, it includes height, and it includes the dominant cover genus that's present in the, in the vegetation that's being assessed. So we have growth form, its cover, its height, and then a basic classification of the dominant genus. Remembering that genus is the first of the two terms used in a binomial nomenclature. For eucalyptus rossii, we're of course talking about the genus eucalyptus. The NVIS has allowed mapping of vegetated ecosystems at a consistent scale across the country, and there are very detailed notes around how it needs to be applied. We'll look at it very, very briefly in a later practical, but be aware that the NVIS is there, and it is widely applied, and has given rise to a number of very specific measurement systems. But it's also worth bearing in mind why it is that we classify the vegetation based upon those key metrics, growth form, cover, and height. What is it about those three structural attributes? Of course, there's a composition attribute in terms of the dominant genus, but what is it about those three dominant attributes that are important to us? Well, first let's Bear in, let's define what they mean. First of all, we need to bear in mind that the NVIS relies upon the description of the dominant stratum. Let's recognise that vegetation exists in strata and, depending on where we are, 
the number of strata present vary substantially. You can see here in this poa grassland that we have a dominant stratum composed of poa species, whereas in this eucalyptus regnans stand we have a dominant oversory stratum composed of eucalyptus regnans, a mid layer here that is composed of uh, cool temperate rainforest species such as Nothophagus cunninghamii, and then a lower stratum here composed of Dixonia antarctica. So there may be multiple or there may be single strata, but it is the dominant strata, the tallest dominant stratum that we are interested in describing. Within that stratum, we also aim to describe very, very briefly what the growth forms constitute, and that is a functional grouping that defines and helps us understand the nature and processes associated with the dominant stratum. Height, the vertical projection above the ground, perhaps an obvious thing to say, but there are different measures of height, vegetation height, that we might, uh, we might apply depending on the circumstance. We'll look at height in a moment. Canopy, cover, the horizontal projection of the canopy, the upper stratum canopy, onto the ground, and bear in mind that there are a number of different canopy cover metrics that we might apply, and a couple of different canopy metrics can be used within the NVIS. The last component is the floristic component, the dominant overstory, or the dominant stratum uh, genus, and in this case, eucalyptus, and in that case, poa. So let's have a look at these different elements. First, growth forms. What are they? Well, defined as functional groupings that re reflect plant level functional traits, what the heck does that mean? Well, first let's think about what a functional trait. If we were to describe a trait of this plant behind me, we might look at its flowers and we might say, well, because of the nature of the flowers that it has, or because of perhaps more importantly the shape of the leaves that it has. These very short spiky leaves, it has a trait, first of all it's a shrub, it's also an angiosperm or a dicotyledonous uh, plant. It also, because of these very very spiky leaves, falls into a group of plants that we'd refer to as ericoid. Now, if we describe these attributes, we perhaps if we understood vegetation ecology, well, recognising these traits would tell us something about the underlying soil, that it's depauperate, it has low nutrient content, perhaps it is seasonally wet and dry, depending on the season. So a simple classification of a growth form can give us insight into the nature of the land upon which the plant is growing. One way that we might consider this is in the context of Black Mountain. Remember in the Black Mountain lecture I talked about the difference between reseeders and resprouters following fire disturbance. That trait, the way that a plant regenerates after disturbance, is a key functional trait. It tells us a great deal about the plants themselves and how they function. Similarly, if we compare a heath shrub to what we refer to as a mallee shrub. A mallee shrub is just a large shrub with multiple stems without spiky leaves. The difference between them is obvious to us when we look at them, but it sort of belies this sort of greater information. And that greater information is what a heath shrub can tolerate in terms of soil nutrition, as well as periodic wetting and drying. Of course, there are more than just mallee and heath shrubs. There are a whole suite of vegetation growth forms. And remember that these growth forms, like all functional traits, represent functional attributes of the plant, how they survive, how they respond to disturbance, what they can tolerate. And so they are key adaptations to a physical environment. And they tell us a great deal about those physical environments as well as the disturbance processes that they have to respond to.
Now, we won't spend a great deal of time looking at and thinking about vegetation growth forms. But bear in mind, within the vegetation classification systems of Australia, these are the growth form types into which vegetation is broken. You can see that there are trees at the top classified into trees and tree mallees. The second of those describes stable forest and woodland settings in which individual trees generate multiple stems and that that form is sustained you know, in, in, over, over and it, well, is simply sustained. And there are a handful of Mallee ecosystems in Australia, most notably in Western Victoria and in South Australia, but also some Alpine Mallee systems as well. You can see that shrubs are broken down into multiple components. You can see kenopod shrubs and heath shrubs that separate out these very spiky leaved plants that, are, that tolerate um, low nutrient soils, or kenopod shrubs, often those that can tolerate salty conditions or extremely dry conditions. Then below those, we have all of the grasses, sedges, and rushes. So the grasses are broken into three categories that describe different life forms whether they are underground or above ground stolons that allow for a matting grass, like you might see on a golf green or something like that, a hummock grass, like spinifex, that has growing tips on the outside, or a uh, tussock grass that produces an isolated tussock with a growing bud in the middle. Each of those have different mechanisms for vegetatively propagating themselves. <clears throat> but they also have very different re responses to disturbance. The latter growth forms describe variations on our monocots, bear in mind that grasses, sedges and rushes are all monocots, describe different conditions, growing conditions, the sedges and rushes, in terms of just how waterlogged or aquatic the ecosystem is that you find them in. Forbes describe all non-woody plants that are dicotyledonous, dandelions, pansies, pumpkins, all fall within Forbes, and the presence of Forbes generally reflects a higher nutrient and more consistently moist soil structure than you would find for the, the graminoids, the grasses, rushes, and sedges. So as you can see, going through that list of growth forms, means that once we classify a growth form, we are able to in make some inferences around the nature of the land upon which we're, we're surveying. All right, so what about vegetation height? Vegetation height is an important metric Let's say if you're interested in estimating carbon stocking or productivity per unit area. But why is it important more generally when it comes to describing vegetation? Well, first of all, there is that issue of productivity. That tree or vegetation height represents the capacity of the land upon which the vegetation is growing to produce biomass. The more biomass, the taller it will be. Why taller? Well, because competition drives the vegetation upwards. You can only have many strata, multiple strata, if the vegetation is taller. So tall vegetation tends to be vegetation with more strata, more species present, and more opportunities for fauna species to nest, to feed, and to live. So tree and vegetation height is an important attribute that has relevance to ecological understanding of ecosystems. It's also a good indicator of the way that an ecosystem or a piece of land functions from an energetic point of view. Remember that growing upwards is an energetically costly experience. Only the plants with the most energy available to them, or excess energy available to them, have the capacity to produce wood that is sufficient for them to grow upwards, and in some cases grow at least 100 metres upwards. 
You really need a lot of excess energy to do that. Now, to do that, you must be growing in an appropriate thermal condition, but you also need to be growing in an appropriate humidity condition. And we see that relationship between height and growing conditions expressed here in this graph. This is a really lovely paper in New Phytologist that identified or reported on the association between tree height and thermal ecosystem types across the world. And we see that there is an aggregation of the tallest vegetation types in a very narrow band of annual temperature and also a very narrow band in terms of the seasonal temperature range. What that reflects is not only consistently, not only moderate to warm growing conditions, but also very little variation over the course of the season. Something that is common at lower elevations and also in areas where there is a relatively high relative humidity or places where something we term vapor pressure deficit does not impact upon growth. Now, that term vapor pressure deficit may be new to you, but of course, I'm sure you appreciate that plants lose water to the atmosphere through pores in their leaves. Now, that loss of water plays a very big role in determining how quickly or how far a plant can grow upwards. Of course, plant genetics, plant growth forms affect that, but between sites, plants of the same species vary in terms of their heights because of something we refer to as the height limitation hypothesis. It's an interesting topic to become engaged in, but understand at its core, it reflects the impact of evaporative conditions on the conductance of water out of the stomata in the leaves, what we refer to as stomatal conductance. As plants grow taller, the resistance of water moving up through a stem means that the amount of water that, uh, that the stomatal aperture can lose begins to fall because the water experiences resistance on the way up. That resistance changes the form that leaves can attain and then in turn those leaves they get thicker, heavier and they transpire less water. Less transpiration, more CO2 coming into the leaf, photosynthesis is then, de then uh, reduced. And you, you can imagine then, as a plant gets taller and taller, leaf traits change, the resistance associated with moving water up the stem changes, all of those things impact upon photosynthesis. It is only possible for then for a plant to reach a very tall height if, the, uh, if it can offset the impact of that resistance and that tends to only happen in humid locations. So vegetation height is an important indicator of growing conditions within a site. Changes in, in vegetation height can really indicate very quickly changes in the growing conditions as well. Insofar as cover, we're interested in the canopy cover of the, of the dominant overstory again. Again, canopy cover or foliage cover is the projection on the ground, the horizontal projection of the canopy above, like this, like this snow gum forest. Now we can express cover by the entire canopy or just sections of it we can break the canopy up into different sociological rankings as we will do on Black Mountain, on Gallimbari, um, during our field sessions, classifying trees into different dominance classes. Now there are a number of different metrics and each of these is used to some extent within the national vegetation system. If you're interested in vegetation, it's worth understanding that these metrics differ depending upon one, whether they assume that the crown is a, is a solid that then projects onto the ground, whether we're interested in just the cover of foliage and, and stems, or whether we're interested in the projective foliage cover, that is, the cover by foliage only. That's a very difficult thing to assess. And progressively, as you move down through this list, 
the assessment becomes more difficult. But of course, these different metrics are important for different applications. Then we get to floristics. So we've covered growth form, height, and canopy cover. Well, at least we've introduced the concepts associated with them. What about floristics? Of course, the broad floristic formation requires description of the dominant genus in the overstory. But what about all the rest? Surely all of these species matter and we need to assess them. Well, yes we do. But the assessment of species is very context specific. Remember that there can be many species present and it can take quite a long time for us to assess them. Nevertheless, species are assessed in many instances. and We're interested in an array of different things. The richness, that is the number of species that are present, or their relative abundance and we get measures of diversity. Now, differences in species composition can tell us a lot about disturbance, especially in vegetation like this, where we have herbaceous plants that respond very quickly to disturbance, or where there are species that are present that are known to respond quickly to fire by reseeding or re-sprouting. Of course, if we have a specific taxon specific monitoring program or management outcome, then we need to assess for vegetation. In the NVIS, of course, we restrict our assessment of vegetation to the dominant overstory, but do bear in mind that in many instances, all of the vegetation is assessed. Monitoring of snow gum, for example, includes detailed species classification of all understory species that are present. That list can run to the many hundreds, as it does on Black Mountain. And therein you have the limitation associated with floristic description. That is, there are many, many species out there to describe, and sometimes recognising those species can be quite difficult to do. Also, in, a in addition to that difficulty, the presence or the apparent presence of species at times is completely dependent upon the season that you make the observation or the conditions in which you make them. These orchids, for example, are only evident on Gallimbari when they're in flower. And that only happens in October. And even then, in some years, they don't flower at all, depending on the conditions. So if we went to Black Mountain Gallimbari tomorrow, as we're going to do, we won't see any of these glossodia because they're not in flower. If we go at the wrong time, we simply won't even know they're present. So vegetation monitoring requires not only a deep understanding of how to identify, but also requires multiple visits to properly, properly characterise the vegetation that's present. So if we're interested in vegetation, what is it that we record? Well, there are three basic types of vegetation that we record. Presence and absence, abundance and density. Presence and absence obviously is self-explanatory, whether something is there or not. We characterise it as yes, no, or zeros and ones. It's a binomial classification. It has many applications and it tends to be a very quick, relatively quick thing to it to assess and it's useful in general description and mapping of ecosystems. Abundance differs because we not only make a count of what is present in terms of the number of things that are present, but we make that count for a defined unit of effort. So it is a discrete outcome. So the amount of time we spend surveying, the number of people who survey, a defined unit of effort. And we make use of abundance studies so that we can compare results between different sites and different assessment techniques necessarily. Then we have density, where like we will do with our data, we express our vegetation metrics relative to a unit area upon which we survey that vegetation. And it's really great for assessing things like mass or population structure like we'll be doing for Black Mountain.
So three basic vegetation types, regardless, uh, sorry, vegetation metrics, regardless of what you're assessing and what you're doing, our metrics fall generally within, fall within these three categories. But how do we actually do it on the ground? Well, there are three basic, well, things always come in threes, it seems. There are three basic approaches, the point, the plot, and the transect three different techniques that we use for assessing vegetation. As the name indicates, a point method is based upon simply making an observation that something is present or absent at a defined point. Generally, a point is something that is dimensionless. Now, the way that we actually apply that, either using laser fired from an uh, 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 airborne vehicle flying over, detecting where something is or whether something's present, using one of these things, like we will use in the prac, a GRS densitometer, to detect whether canopy is or isn't present above us, or we can use a, a formal physical frame to detect whether there is vegetation directly under our feet. All we are assessing in each of these cases is whether there is something present or not. Now, we typically undertake point-based measures along a transect. We don't just make one point observation. We make multiple point observations along a fixed line or a transect. We can make them in a randomly distributed fashion, but it is more consistent, more, more, it is more typical for us to make them in a formal structured transect. Now, if we were, for example, to use a point-based approach to assess the presence of something. Let's say we wanted to estimate the percent cover by a vegetation. We might measure out 100 metres and then make an observation every metre to assess whether there's vegetation present. Every time there is a present, we record that as present. Every time it's absent, it's absent. For us to calculate the percent cover then, we simply divide the number of times we assess vegetation as present divided by the number of total times we assessed for the vegetation. So maybe we saw vegetation 48 times out of 100, well, percent covers 48%. And that's the way that point measurements on transects are used. Now it's very simple and it's very objective to determine whether something is present or absent. And it's very, even though the data are binomial and in their nature, we can aggregate it up, those data up into percent-based measures, as we see here. But to do that, you need to make a lot of observations. All right, so there we have a point. Now, there's also an intercept method, again conducted on a transect. This time, instead of making observations at discrete points and then determining whether something is present, this method turns that around, like this person is doing behind me. You put out a transect and then determine whether something, where vegetation starts and where it stops, and you measure the length of the line intercepted by that vegetation. So rather than measuring at a defined point and making the decision about presence and absence, we first make the decision about presence and absence and then measure the interval covered by that vegetation. It takes longer, of course, than just measuring presence and absence, but you can measure shorter distances. It's still objective and it generates pretty high resolution data. It's very useful. To calculate it, of course, you just divide the length of the transect intercepted by the total length of the transect assessed. So if 62, 62 metres of a 100 metre long transect is covered by vegetation, then we have 62% cover. And you can see that these kind of transects are applied in all sorts of circumstances. Now the last of the methods that we have when we assess vegetation are plots. Now plots are, as the name suggests, fixed areas upon which we conduct assessments of vegetation. The way that we do that varies depending upon what the intent of the measurement is. 
If, for example, we're interested in expressing vegetation cover, it is common for us to, within a plot or a quadrant, as they're also known, especially when they're small, to use one of these kind of systems, such as the Bron Blanquet or the Doman scale, to describe the percentage of cover. In addition to the Bron Blanquet and Doman, you can see there's also the Dafour scheme that describes vegetation as dominant, abundant, frequent, occasional, or rare. The Dafour system is more typically used to describe species abundance as opposed to cover, whereas you can see that both the Bromblanquet and the Doman scale refer explicitly to cover by vegetation. Now, it can be a difficult thing to do, of course, to simply look at vegetation and to estimate the percentage cover by that vegetation. Well, it varies a great deal between observers. And so we tend to have these kind of schematics that help try to systematise the way and standardise the way that different assessors see different vegetation types. Here we have a set of samples taken from the Australian Soil and Land Survey field book on how to describe different percentages of cover in different ecosystem types. The percentages are shown moving upwards or downwards and different vegetation types are shown along the bottom, ranging from eucalypts through to casuarina woodlands. Now in terms of the size of plots, that's one of the things that we play with a lot when we're out assessing vegetation. Of course the size of a plot needs to be varied depending upon the circumstances in which it's being applied. Also when we think about size, we need to bear in mind the interplay between the size of a plot and the number that we're going to measure. So first of all, when it comes to different vegetation types, small vegetation, small plants, small plots, big plants, big plots. And so the plot sizes scale depending on the size of the organism. Say in this example from Mueller de Bois, which is a really great text by the way, Mueller de Bois here illustrates as you move up from small lichen up into forest, the size of the associated plot needs to increase with the size of the individual. But what about this interplay between plot size and the number of plots? Well, of course, you need, again, this is very context dependent. Bear in mind that small plots might be fast to measure, but they represent a relative, a very small area of the vegetation that you're interest, interested in and may not capture the sort of variability associated with a site. If that's the case, then you need to measure multiple plots in a single location, whereas you might get away with a single plot if it's a big one. So there is this play between how big a plot and how many you need to assess. Remember, you need to consider how big the organisms are and then how much variability there is within the ecosystem you're working. How do you know all these things? Well, Vegetation assessment, like so many things, always commences with a piece of pilot work where you go out and you test the methods that you're interested in applying to assess whether the size of the plot, the number of plots you have in mind, are both going to be appropriate. Now here we have some examples of different ecosystems. An alpine herb field, for example, using a very small quadrant because the plants themselves are very small. Alternatively, in a tall closed forest, a minimum plot size of perhaps 50 by 50 might be required to properly represent the density of, say, eucalyptus regnans in this case, on per unit area of land. Many of the techniques that I have referred to, in fact all of them so far, and even if I didn't express and say so explicitly for plots, Plots too, just like intercept and point-based measures, are generally conducted or frequently conducted on a transect. 
And that is what we'll be doing on Black Mountain, Galambari. So a transect is any line or route through a survey area that we take to conduct our observations. And they are widely applied in ecology and in many other instances. Indeed, many medical studies based upon organs and other tissues across other fields of study often make use of transect-based measures. We can use them to assess change over time or, in particular, change over space. And we can make them straight, bend, we can make them do whatever we like. The key thing is that we need to define our transect so that it is appropriate for the circumstances that we're using it in. So let's have a look at a couple. Well, the standard transect involves simply putting out a tape or a virtual line and walking along that and conducting our assessments either using points at discrete locations or an intercept based approach. So as we encounter things, we measure. You can see here an example taken from my own work with tree rings that transects themselves can be used to measure events. Here we have an intercept based measure identifying where individual tree rings occur along a measured transect. In the same way, as I mentioned, medical studies can use transects across organ tissue to measure the occurrence of cell abnormalities. From planes as well, we can use transects that don't require a physical marker on the ground. Rather, as we fly along, we have these markers hanging below the wind that give us a line that we use to assess when that line intersects with an attribute of interest. Bear in mind that a transect doesn't always need to be straight. If, for example, we're interested in assessing a narrow vegetation type, like a river line that moves around, meanders, then we might not be able to use a straight line, a straight transect, to assess that. Rather, we might use a zigzag to make sure that we are assessing that vegetation type consistently and repeatedly. Here, an example of a transect that moves from one vegetation type into another. The second of those vegetation types is a vegetation type that has been disturbed by fire. So as we move along this gradient, we can see the impact of fire on this ecosystem. And as I speak about ecosystems and the use of transects, Bear in mind that transects can vary immensely in size. We might use a transect on Black Mountain, Gallimbury, that might be 50 or 100 metres long. But be aware that the vegetation network here across Australia also includes some incredibly long Australian transects that cover differences as we move, let's say, from very humid into arid conditions, from Mediterranean into arid conditions. And you can see rainfall gradients as you go from north to south or east into west. We have different gradients that we can assess on the small as well as large scales. Well, that is a really short introduction to the use of vegetation assessment at both small and large scales. A couple of the key things that I've covered there are around the kind of structural attributes that we assess for things such as the vegetation, the National Vegetation Information Scheme, the type of data we collect, presence, absence, abundance and density, the types of um, assessment techniques that we take, that we use, point, intercept and plots, and also the intersection with transects. Make sure that when you look at your vegetation data in the coming weeks, you think about the calculation methods in particular that I've highlighted for both the point and intercept measure methods for assessing canopy cover. We'll definitely be making use of them.